next installment of the Faraway Fulvia Talks. Today we have a great pleasure. Uh, Professor Joel Tropp from California Institute of Technology will teach us about how to make or not to make decisions. We'll see about the scratchy part. Joel, it's all yours. Thanks, Wojtek. It's a pleasure to be here at the Faraway Fourier Talks. Um, I um, regret that I can't uh, be with you in person in Maryland. Okay, I have a lot to tell you today, so I want to get started. Um, the first order of business is to um, say that this is a, a long project with a number of collaborators. Um, and I'd like to highlight the role of Alp Yurt Sever, who is a graduate student in EPFL and is now a postdoc at MIT. Um, he's really the driving force behind this research and without him, I wouldn't have anything to tell you. Um, so um, without any further ado, um, I'm gonna start by telling you about an imaging problem that leads to a semi-definite program. And this will give you an idea about why semi-definite programming is valuable for um, uh, data analysis and signal processing problems, um, how some semi-definite programming problems arise and some of the challenges that um, appear from these kinds of optimization problems. Okay, so, um, let me remind you briefly about the fundamental challenge in optical microscopy. You have a choice between field of view or resolution if you're using um, uh, conventional optics. Either you can image the entire slide at very low resolution, or you can image a tiny piece of the slide at high resolution, but you can't have both. And so if you're doing digital pathology, for example, you would really like high resolution across the entire field of view but it's just not possible with a conventional optical microscope. So what do you do? One of my colleagues, Chang Wei Yang, designed a microscope that can achieve both field of, wide field of view and high resolution simultaneously by using computational imaging. So here's the idea. You have a sample you'd like to image, and you're gonna do that with an ordinary microscope, a lens and a detector, but here's the twist. You're going to illuminate the sample from different directions using an LED array. So in the first, um, you take the first image by illuminating from one angle, you collect a picture, you illuminate from a different angle, you collect another picture and so forth. And eventually you get a whole stack of different illuminations of the sample. And then you use a computer, digital signal processing to combine these into a single high resolution um, image of the sample across the entire field of view. Okay, so let me give you an illustration of what this looks like. So here's a picture of um, some blood cells that are um, infected with malaria parasite. And here are 29 different illuminations um, that are collected with this system. And you can see that none of them is particularly high quality in and of themselves. Um, and they have a fair bit of diversity among them. And each one is 80 by 80 pixels. And the idea is that we're gonna take this stack of 29 um, small illuminations and we're going to process them to produce a larger image um, that is higher resolution. So here's a picture um, that's 160 by 160 pixels of the phase of the slide. The phase roughly reflects the thickness of the sample. And so here I've shown the X and Y gradient of the phase, much like a phase contrast microscope would give you. And so you can see that the locations of the cells stand out and you can see these rings here in the cells which are um, malaria parasites, okay? So this is basically what this microscope is intending to do. It um, illuminates a sample from different directions, it collects a bunch of illuminations and then uses computing to produce a high resolution image. All right, now let's make this a little more mathematical. So. As you will recall, if you illuminate an image from um, a different direction, this amounts to a linear shift in the frequency domain of the sample um, transmission function, which is this vector psi. The aperture is a low pass filter. So that's also a linear operation. So the action of the illumination and the lens together is linear. But this microscope has a, detector that can only record the intensity of the light field. So instead of recording the, um, um, this linear function of the sample transmission function, instead it records its squared magnitude, perhaps contaminated with some noise. And so 
the entire action of the system can be encapsulated as a bunch of um, inner products between the unknown sample transmission function and vectors AI that describe the Fourier typography system. So these are really just um, shifted low pass filters or band pass filters. And so you can easily characterize these and you can think of them as no. And so the idea is that we'd like to take this collection of pixel values um, from all of those illuminations and figure out what the sample transmission function psi is that gave rise to that observed data. Now, we can frame this problem as a non-convex optimization in the following way. So we know the AI, the vectors that describe the imaging system. We know the BI, the measured illuminations, the pictures we've taken of the sample. And what we'd like to do is search for a vector X, which is our guess for the sample transmission function, that gives rise to intensities that are close to the observed intensities. And we're gonna measure the discrepancy between what we reconstruct and what we observe using a loss function that is convex and inverse coordinate. And we're gonna sum this error over all of the pixels and all of the illuminations, okay? So to reiterate, we observed squared magnitudes of a linear function of an unknown. And we're going to frame a non-convex optimization problem to try and recover the image that we're interested in. So the variable X describes the image. Now, to give some idea about what this problem looks like, um, for the malaria example I showed you before, um, there are 25,600 elements in the vector X because this is 160 by 160 image. The number of measurements we have, which corresponds to the total number of pixels in the 29 illuminations is about 185,600. So we're summing up 100, about 200,000 um, terms in this loss function. And the unknown is about a vector of length 25,000. So this is a modest, sized optimization problem. The challenge is that it is not convex. And so it's actually quite difficult for us to solve this in practice. Okay, good. Now, here's one approach to trying to make this problem a little bit more tractable. So this idea goes back to a paper by um, uh, Bernard Bodman and Rudu Balan, Pete Kasatza, and Edelman. And they noticed that phase retrieval can be lifted to a problem that's linear or multilinear. And the technique is very simple. It's very familiar probably to many of you. You take the squared inner product, you write it out as A transpose, XX transpose A. And then you notice that XX transpose is a rank one positive semi-definite matrix, so you give it a new name, okay? So when you make this change of variables, the optimization problem I showed you before converts into a problem where you're conjugating a matrix X by these vectors that describe the imaging system. You're comparing that with the uh, observed data. And you're trying to minimize this now over matrices that are M by N and subject to the conditions that X is positive semi-definite and has rank one because we would like it to collapse down to a um, um, a vector X that describes the sample transmission function. Now, the great thing about this formulation is that the objective now is a convex function of the matrix X because it's linear, the first coordinate's linear in X and the loss is convex in the first coordinate. So we have replaced the non-convex objective with one that's convex, so this is fantastic, but the problem is still hard to solve because of the rank constraint, which makes this an MP hard optimization problem. So to address this challenge, we're going to follow Mariam Fazel and drop the rank constraint or replace it with a trace constraint. Um, the idea being that by controlling the trace, we can implicitly try and find solutions to this problem that are low rank or close to low rank. Okay. So when we do that, we obtain an optimization problem with a convex objective and a convex constraint set. And this is an example of a nonlinear semi-definite program, and it can be solved in, um, um, with computationally efficient algorithms. Now, 
the problem with this approach is that instead of getting the sample transmission function x, this vector, we've instead got a matrix x, which may or may not be low rank. And so after we've solved this problem, we still have to take the solution and produce an estimate for the image. And to do that, we're simply going to report the maximum eigenvector of the matrix X star that solves this optimization problem. So the best, um, the maximum eigenvector gives rise to the best rank one approximation of X. And we can think about the maximum eigenvector X star as our guess for the sample transmission function. Okay, so this is a very standard approach um, to solving phase retrieval problems. Again, I credit this idea to um, Bernard and to Radu. Um, and their collaborators. And again, to fix ideas, how big is this problem? Well, now we still have a sum of 200,000 terms here, but the variable has changed size. Instead of a vector of length n, it's a matrix of dimension n squared. And what's n squared? For the malaria example, it's 655 million. So the variable now in this problem um, has 655 million real degrees of freedom and um, it would take about four gigabytes to write down explicitly. Okay, so we've replaced a relatively modest optimization problem with one that has a huge number of variables. So it seems like perhaps we've made our lives more difficult and it's actually common conventional wisdom that um, we can't solve these problems in practice. So this idea is primarily of um, intellectual interest. Now, the fact is that it might still be worth doing this. So here's a little bit of evidence. So you could try and solve that original optimization problem using um, gradient descent, which um, is sometimes called Verdinger flow in this context, but um, it's actually nothing more elaborate than gradient descent. And this gives you garbage. So the Fourier tachography problem is pretty hard to solve. And the images you get from doing gradient descent on the objective are worse than the original images that you've recorded with the microscope. Okay, so so much for um, the triumph of non-convex optimization. Okay, so you think to yourself, well, I, I actually know something about solving um, semi-definite programs. I'm gonna use the Burr-Montero method, which replaces the matrix variable by a um, factorized form, YY, transpose where y is a tall matrix, but maybe not rank one, maybe it's rank two or rank 10 or rank 100 or something like that. And now I'm gonna solve that nonlinear program over the matrix variable y. Well, that sort of works. You get an okay image when you do that, um, but you can see there's a lot of background variability here. And so it's hard to tell whether inside these cells are malaria sites or ringing artifacts um, associated with the poor solution to the problem. What I would really like when I solve this optimization problem is this image here on the right, where um, the phase is accurate enough that the phase gradients actually give us a reasonable image with low background variation, where I can really see the locations of the cells and the location of the parasites inside the cells. But as I said before, conventional wisdom is that we can't solve these kinds of optimization problems so too hard. And so what I'd like to tell you about is an approach for um, addressing this challenge and producing a provably correct algorithm for solving this optimization problem. So to recap briefly, um, I've argued that there are applications in data science that lead to large um, scale but structured semi-definite programs. Um, it's often the case that these semi-definite programs are pretty simple. Um, in this case, the amount of problem data is a lot smaller than the number of degrees of freedom in the matrix variable. And I've also argued that what I really want when I solve this problem is not necessarily the whole matrix solution, but rather a low rank approximation to the solution. And it's also well known that there are many settings where the solutions to an SDP are well approximated by low rank matrices. Um, that might be because the SDP is intended as a relaxation of a rank minimization problem, as I've shown you in the Fourier tachography example. It might be because the SDP is weakly constrained and you can um, apply work of Barvinik or Pataki to argue that the SDP must have a low rank solution. 
There are other examples too that come, for example, in um, power, um, optimal power flow, where the topology of the electrical network um, leads to SDPs that have guaranteed low rank solutions. Okay. So in short, we'd like to solve big SDPs, but maybe um, they don't involve that much information and we can get away with producing a low rank um, solution to the problem. So what's the algorithmic challenge? As I've said before, these problems aren't so easy to solve. So it turns out that arithmetic is very often not the, the primary issue for solving these problems. Rather, it's the storage cost. Um, the matrices are just too big because you take a problem where a vector has length n, where n is moderate, you square the um, length of the vector, and all of a sudden you're in a world where you can't write down the matrix anymore. And because of the size of the matrices, moving the data around can also be extremely expensive to the point where um, the bottleneck actually comes from moving um, information in and out of um, the processor. So in short, the challenge that I'd like to address is whether we can actually design um, a correct SDP solver that economizes on storage and works well enough to be practical for um, real um, optimization problems. Okay, good. So with that preamble behind, I'd like to continue with um, an introduction to how we're gonna solve this problem in the case of a um, simple nonlinear semi-definite programming template. Okay, so here's the model problem that we're gonna be talking about today. This is um, something that you might call convex low rank matrix optimization. And this is a generalization of the Fourier tachography problem we saw before. So let's start here with the constraint. We're gonna be searching over matrices X that are positive semi-definite and have trace equal to alpha where alpha is a parameter. Okay, so the constraint set is positive semi-definite matrices with trace alpha. And I'm going to try among these matrices to find one that minimizes the following objective. We're going to apply a linear map to the matrix X to get a vector of length D. And then I'm going to take the vector of length D and run it through a convex smooth function to get a summary value. Now, to understand why this is a reasonable template, you should think back to the example I showed you before. You should think about the matrix. The operator A is extracting D linear measurements of an M by N matrix. So for example, it's the action of the imaging system um, on a um, sample, um, uh, on a rank one matrix corresponding to a sample. The function F you should think about as a loss function for some observed data B. So AX is a guess for the um, um, solution, uh, sorry, AX is like the measurements associated with some matrix, and we're comparing that with some observed data. And in many contexts, the number of measurements we take is way, 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 way smaller than the number of degrees of freedom in the matrix X, which is N squared. And finally, it's very often the case that we want a low rank solution to this problem. So in the case of the tachography problem, it's because the rank one approximation of the solution gives us our estimate for the unknown image. And so I hope you can see that this is really a direct generalization of the tachography problem that I showed you before, but in fact, it models a lot of other problems in signal processing statistics and machine learning for the same reason. We're extracting measurements of some matrix and we're comparing those measurements with some observed data. Okay, so this is the problem that we would like to solve. Now, as I said before, we might like a low rank solution to the problem, but it's actually MP hard to solve this problem if you add the side constraint that the matrix has rank less than or equal to R for any fixed parameter R. So what are we gonna do instead? We're gonna perform a sleight of hand. So instead of trying to find a low rank solution to the problem, we are going to try and find a low rank approximation of a solution to the problem. So it's very important the order that we've put these words. We're trying to find a low rank approximation 
of an actual solution to the SDP. Okay. And we can quantify that by saying that our approximation x hat is rank r, and as compared with the optimal point of the problem, the error is pretty small as compared with the best rank r approximation of that optimal point. Now, this is a target that is not computationally difficult for us to aim for. And this is great because if the solution to the problem has low rank, then the approximation has to be equal to the true solution. So at least in the case where the problem has a low rank solution, we're going to find it even with this relaxed um, goal of finding an a low rank approximation to a solution. On the other hand, if the solution to the problem have very, very high rank, then this condition doesn't really tell us anything about x hat. But in that case, why are we trying to find a low rank approximation to a point that doesn't have a low rank approximation? It just doesn't make any sense. So it's totally reasonable for us to try and do this, especially for problems where the solutions tend to be close to low rank. So in a sense, this is the most important idea in this entire project. So let me pause and ask if there are any questions that I can address about this before we go on. No? Okay, great. So we're gonna look for low rank approximations of a solution. Now, the second question that we need to ask is how much storage we can hope um, to um, get by with when we're trying to solve this problem. So in the model problem that I showed you, all of the complexity of the problem pretty much is hidden inside this linear map A. And I'd like to hide that from you by turning A into a black box. And so as a user of these kinds of algorithms, it's your job to provide routines for implementing this linear map A. And we're gonna require two particular primitives. The first primitive is that we can apply A to a rank one matrix. So in other words, you can think about computing the measurements associated with a rank one matrix. So in the tychography problem, this would basically be applying the tychography system to some um, observed sample transmission function, okay? So this takes a vector of length n and reports a vector of length d, the measurements of that rank one matrix. The second thing that we need is operation on the adjoint map. So we need to be able to apply the forward operator and the backward operator. This operation is a little harder to understand, but what we're doing here is basically doing back projection. We're taking some guess for the measurement z, we're reconstructing a matrix from that and then we're multiplying that matrix by a vector u to get another vector. It's in no way obvious that this is a natural approach to working with the adjoint, but you'll see why um, this is the primitive that we're going to use a little bit later. And the great thing is that this takes two little vectors and reports a vector back. So at no point do we ever have to instantiate a matrix. So in some sense, we're hiding the complexity of the linear map inside these operations, and we want to be able to use these operations to um, efficiently solve the optimization problem. Now, when you look at the storage cost associated with the operations, you can see that it takes m plus d just to store the output. And you can't really control what the output is, so you're going to be stuck with m plus d storage if these are your primitives. Now, remember that instead of reporting a solution to that nonlinear SDP, we're just going to report a low rank approximation to the solution. And that's going to take order r times n storage to report that low rank matrix in factored form. And so the, I'm going to say that an algorithm for solving the nonlinear SDP is storage optimal if its working storage is the total of these two numbers. Um, so d plus rn storage rather than the n squared storage, which it would take to write down the matrix variable for the problem. So in particular, any op optimal storage algorithm for this problem is forbidden from ever writing down a full size matrix variable. Okay? And so it might seem like it's impossible to achieve this goal, but I'll show you that you can do it. Okay, any questions on how we're thinking about storage and what our storage goals are? Okay. 
All right, moving along. So I'm going to tell you about an algorithm called Sketchy CGM. CGM is the conditional gradient method, um, also known as Frank Wolf. And this is an algorithm that achieves the goals that I set out before and um, has a relatively simple geometry. It's easy to understand what's happening here. So conditional gradient is one of many, many techniques you could design for trying to solve optimization problems. Um, we're going to apply it to the problem of minimizing over the set of density matrices, so positive semi-definite matrices with trace one, a function g of x, where g is convex and smooth. Okay? So I want to minimize a convex smooth function over this compact convex set. So here's how conditional gradient works. It takes an initial guess for the iterate x and tries to improve it, much like most optimization algorithms. Now, the classical idea in optimization is to take a step in the direction of the negative and gradient, because this is the direction in which the objective decreases most quickly locally. Now, what conditional gradient does is a little bit different. So instead of taking a step in the direction of the negative gradient, it follows the negative gradient as far as it can inside the constraint set until it arrives at an extreme point. Okay. So it finds the point in the constraint set that's most correlated with the negative gradient, say h. And instead of updating x by taking a step in the direction of the negative gradient, it takes a step in the direction of h, the point that's most correlated with the negative gradient. Okay. So that's what this formula, these two formulas say. Find a point in the constraint set most correlated with the negative gradient, average that point into our current guess for the iterate, and by convexity, this is always going to be another point in the constraint set, and then we repeat as necessary. Now, the beautiful, beautiful thing about conditional gradient for matrix optimization is that the set of density matrices has a very simple set of extreme points. It consists precisely of the rank one matrices. And so any extreme point of the set has the form UU transpose, where U is a vector. And in fact, we can find the point H that's most correlated with the negative gradient simply by solving an eigenvector problem. So what we need is actually the minimum eigenvector of the gradient of G at the point X. Okay. And we're gonna take that eigenvector and form its outer product to get the update direction X. Okay. So that's how conditional gradient works. That's why it's so appealing for matrix optimization. So here's pseudocode for conditional gradient. We start out with the matrix zero, which isn't in the constraint set, but that's not actually important because we're gonna forget the initial iterate. At each step, we're gonna compute the gradient of the objective, which has this complicated looking form. But this is just gradient of F composed with A. We're gonna compute the minimum eigenvector of this matrix. We're gonna form an update direction, which is minus alpha times the outer product of this eigenvector with itself. And then we're going to average that update direction into the vector, into the matrix X to obtain our new update, our, our new um, iterate. And then we're going to repeat this process. And you can show that conditional gradient um, converges at a rate of one over T, where T is the number of iterations, where F is a nice smooth function. Okay. So very simple, beautiful algorithm. Okay. Now, there's still a step that I haven't explained to you, which is how you compute minimum eigenvectors. And for that, we're going to use the randomized Lanchos algorithm. So um, it's been known for some time that the randomized Lanchos method is a natural fit for the conditional gradient algorithm. So briefly, the Lanchos method minimizes the Rayleigh quotient of the matrix over a Krylov subspace obtained by applying powers of the matrix to an initial vector omega. So you can implement this only using matrix vector products. So it's very efficient in cases where you have access to a matrix vector product. And we're going to randomize the initial vector omega, drawing it from a standard normal distribution. And the beautiful thing about this strategy is that you can always comp compute an approximate minimum eigenvector of a matrix M 
even if the matrix M has no spectral gap, which is very different from the classical analysis of the power method or the Lanchos method, which um, depends inherently on the presence of a spectral gap. So the point is for any matrix M, I can use the randomized Lanchos method to compute an approximate minimum eigenvector using a moderate number of matrix vector, matrix vector multiplies between um, the matrix M and some vectors. And it's worth noting that you can implement this algorithm using storage proportional to the length of the vector. So storage is not really a bottleneck um, in this method. Okay. So altogether, we now have a mechanism for implementing conditional gradient. Um, we use randomized Lanchos to solve the eigenvector problem. And we need to perform multiplications with this matrix here, matrix vector multiplies to implement that algorithm. Okay. Good. So that was sort of the state of the art as of um, about 10 years ago. And people talked about this algorithm as if it were a, an efficient solution for solving semi-definite programs. So this is like a, a rank or storage efficient SPP algorithm. And this is just not true. And the reason is that even though conditional gradient only adds a rank one matrix to the current iterate at each step, this algorithm takes thousands of iterations to converge. And as a consequence, every time you take an iteration, you increase the rank of the iterate. And so the numerical rank of the iterates just keeps going up. And as a consequence, the algorithm requires very high storage and it's actually not even predictable a priori. So this algorithm is not a storage efficient SPP method, but we perceived an opportunity here to convert this algorithm into one that works with optimal storage. So here are the new ideas that you need to do that. And I'll then walk you through how this um, shapes up. So first of all, instead of working with the matrix variable X, which as I told you before, we're never allowed to write down. Instead, we're gonna work with a state variable Z, which is the linear image of X under the map, A, under the linear map A. So remember, a takes D measurements of the matrix X. So the state variable Z is D dimensional, not N squared dimensional. So Z is a much, much lower dimensional object than X. This is fantastic. Um, so we're gonna work with this low dimensional state variable. And instead of storing the matrix X, instead, we are going to sketch the matrix X. We're gonna store a compressed, copy of the matrix variable. And we're gonna keep updating that as the algorithm proceeds. And then finally, after the algorithm has converged, the optimization algorithm has converged, we're going to take that sketch of the matrix variable and we're going to unpack a low rank approximation of the matrix that solves the optimization problem from inside that sketch. So these are the ideas. Drive the iteration with the state variable, sketch the matrix instead of storing it, and then use the sketch to construct a low rank approximate solution to the optimization problem. Okay, so let me show you how this shapes up. So here's the conditional gradient method again, and we're gonna rewrite this in terms of Z, which is the linear image of X under the map A. So you can see one copy of the AX right here in the minimum eigenvector computation. And we need an update rule for the state variable, but we can obtain that by applying the linear map A to the linear update rule for the matrix. So we'll get AX is um, replace, replaces one minus eta AX plus eta times A of H. Okay, good. So that leads to the following algorithm after we change variables. So we, compute an approximate minimum eigenvector using the randomized Lanchos algorithm. So that requires matrix vector multiplies with the matrix A star gradient. Oh, but that's one of our primitives. The adjoint of the linear map applied to a vector and multiplied by another vector. So this is great. We can implement randomized Lanchos using the primitives that we have at hand for the adjoint. Second, 
we're going to find an update direction, which is the linear image of UU transpose, the rank one matrix formed by the eigenvector. But that's great because one of our primitives is applying the linear map to a rank one matrix. Okay. And then to update the state variable, we simply average the update direction into the current state variable. So this is good. It only uses storage M plus D, but there's also a problem. When we converted the matrix variable to a state variable, we forgot the matrix. And the matrix is the thing that we need to solve the optimization problem. So it seems like we've got an iteration, but it doesn't do anything useful because we still need to know the matrix. And that's where sketching comes in. In parallel, while we're driving the iteration with the state variable Z, we're also going to keep track of the matrix X, which solves the optimization problem. So here's how we do that. This slide's going to be a bit dense if you're not familiar with these ideas, um, but um, it is what it is. So here's the idea. Before we start the algorithm, because we need to keep track of the matrix variable, what we are going to do is draw and fix a tall random matrix omega. So if we want to rank our solution to the problem, we're going to take omega to have, say, two R columns. So omega is a very tall random matrix that stays fixed. Now, at each step of this algorithm, instead of maintaining our guess for the matrix variable x, instead, I'm going to keep track of y, which is x multiplied by the matrix omega on the right. So Y is also a tall matrix. And at any given point in the algorithm, Y is always going to have the matrix X times omega inside of it. Now, because the update rule for X is linear and multiplying by omega is linear, I can develop an update rule for Y simply by multiplying the linear update rule for X on the right by the matrix omega. So Y gets updated by rescaling itself and then adding h, the update direction times omega. But remember, the update direction is just a rank one matrix. So this is very, very easy to implement. So I can update the sketch at each iteration. And at each iteration, the sketch always contains the implicit matrix variable x, the conditional gradient would have generated, the implicit matrix variable x, times the random test matrix omega. And then after the algorithm is converged, after conditional gradient has finished solving the optimization problem, I can take y and omega, the information that I have at hand, and I can unpack an approximation to the matrix X that's inside the sketch using this totally non-obvious formula, which is called a truncated Nystrom approximation. And you can prove that X hat is a good low rank approximation to X with high probability. The great thing about this is that it only uses storage proportional to the rank of the output times N. And if the solution to the optimization problem is well approximated by a low rank matrix, then X hat is a good approximation to the solution of the optimization problem. Okay, let me pause and ask if there are any questions on this point. Actually, I have a question. Uh, how do you choose this omega? Uh, Draw like it at random from a standard normal distribution and fix it once and for all. Okay. Yeah. So to compute Y, um, it's going to be like n squared r? Um, no, because y is an m by r matrix. So updating y is n times. So you start out with y equals 0, because x is initially equal to 0. So that's no problem. Then we update y by rescaling it. That's an nr operation. And, and then you need to r. add another matrix of size nr to it. But remember, this is a rank 1 matrix times omega. So that's order um, nr to form the update. Very good, thank you. Let's cheat. Okay, anything else? All right. Uh, I do have a quick one. Yeah. Um, 
Could you say a little bit about why this way to truncate the rank in the Nistrum approximation is better than sort of the classical uh, one that people use where they enforce the rank on the, the middle part of the sketch? Um, in our experience, it works better. Um, but uh, that's a whole other conversation. I know this is something you're very interested in. But uh, right, thanks. Sort of, um, <laughs> say that this is um, a component of prior research. Okay, any other questions? Uh, excuse me, I have one. Um, is this, uh, the conditional gradient method seems uh, uh, analogous to the uh, Frank Wolf optimization method. Is there, can you comment on the relationship between those? It is Frank Wolf. It, it is Frank Wolf. Yeah, it's the same algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Yeah, some people call it prefer to call it conditional gradient. Um, oh. Same thing, yeah. Okay, good, let's move on. Um, so here's pseudocode for this algorithm. So all I've done here is added the sketching steps to the sketched version of conditional gradient. So we initialize the sketch, we update the sketch, and then after we're done with the optimization, we reconstruct um, a low rank matrix X in factored form from the sketch. Here's the code for the sketch. Um, you need to be a little more careful to make sure it's numerically stable, but altogether, this really is about 20 lines of code uh, modulo the randomized land shows um, stuff. Okay, so it's a very simple algorithm to implement, um, but nevertheless, it actually works. And it has the following guarantees. So implicitly, this algorithm computes a sequence of matrices that converge to the solution set of the nonlinear semi-definite program. But remember, it's not allowed to write down any of those matrices. These are hidden from you. These are the iterates that conditional gradient would have generated, but this algorithm doesn't generate them, okay? Instead, it outputs a sequence of rank R approximations, X hat, of the implicit iterates X. Okay, and these X hat are provably good low rank approximations of the X's. And it does this while using the optimal storage, um, D for the state variable plus RN for the sketch. Now, um, you can prove that this works in wide generality, but to write down a simple um, quantitative result, you need to make a few extra assumptions that the solution to the SDP is stable and its optimal point is low rank. But in that case, the low rank iterates that this algorithm produce um, converge to the um, true solution X star at a rate of one over T. Okay. So this algorithm produces low rank iterates that converge to the um, optimal solution at the same rate as conditional gradient under some um, extra assumptions. But even without these assumptions, this algorithm always produces near optimal low rank approximations to a solution of the SVP, and it does so using optimal storage. Um, I'm not gonna quantify the resources you need to get to an epsilon suboptimal result, but it is in fact state of the art. Um, for these problems. So it's actually quite efficient, even once you take into account the proximal eigenvector computations and all the other stuff we need to do to make this rigorous. Okay. Any questions on the theorem? Yes. Uh, how does the number of constraints uh, fit in the theorem? Great question. That's a D. Um, so the state variable has the same dimension as the number of constraints. Um, you can think about it as being um, like a, a kind of dual variable. So the more constraints, the more storage you're going to be using. So for problems that are very heavily constrained, this approach does not have storage benefits, although it's actually still a pretty effective method even for um, more heavily constrained problems. Other questions? Okay, so here. Okay, I still have a few more things to tell you, so I'm gonna um, rush along. Um, so very briefly, I wanna talk about standard form SDPs, which are um, perhaps more widely used, um, but are harder to solve because they don't have any um, 
um, curvature a priori. So let me tell you briefly how we can solve standard form SDPs using similar ideas. So a standard form SDP minimizes a linear function of a matrix X subject to D linear constraints and subject to X being positive semi-definite and having trace alpha. Okay, so we're placing an additional trace constraint on the standard form SDP, um, and that's primarily for simplicity. Okay. So minimize a linear function of a matrix subject to delinear constraints and subject to a trace constraint and subject to the constraint that the matrix positive semi -definite. This is a standard form SDP. But because this problem has no curvature anywhere, um, it's not so clear how you would apply the ideas that I've described before to solve this problem. So very briefly, here's how you do it. Um, you're going to apply the same ideas I showed you to the augmented Lagrangian of the problem. So that instates a dual variable y for the constraints and adds a quadratic penalty on the error in the constraints. This is a nice convex quadratic. Um, and now we need to solve a saddle point problem over the matrix variable X and the dual variable Y. <sighs> to do this, we can use an algorithm called CGAL, which performs a primal update roughly using conditional gradient over the um, compact convex constraint set. It updates the dual variable using a gradient step and gradually increases the um, augmented Lagrangian parameter beta as the iteration proceeds. Okay, so this is an effective method for solving these saddle point problems. And it turns out that this is amenable to the same idea as I showed you. You can add a state variable instead of keeping track of AX, and you can sketch the matrix variable instead of keeping track of the matrix variable. And when you do this, you get an algorithm that provably solves the standard form SDP. Um, has similar guarantees to the conditional gradient method, but only converges at a rate of one over root t. Nevertheless, empirically, this algorithm has one over t convergence, and so it's actually fairly practical for solving real problems, as I'm going to demonstrate to you in just a moment. Okay, so I don't really want to say more about, non about standard form SDPs right now, just to say that Similar ideas allow you to solve standard form SDPs with optimal storage costs um, if you're willing to accept the low rank approximation of a solution. Okay, good. So with the last um, five or 10 minutes, I'd like to show you some numerical evidence about the performance of the sketchy Seagull algorithm for solving standard form SDPs. Okay, so these are sketchy Seagulls. Um, so first of all, let me demonstrate to you that the sketchy Seagal algorithm actually works. So for this picture, I'm solving a max cut SDP on a sparse graph with 10,000 vertices and 20,000 edges. And for the sketching algorithm, I'm going to choose the rank and the sketch size to be capital R. And I'm going to see how the iterates evolve. So in the left-hand panel here, what I'm showing you is the residual error in the objective as compared to the optimal. And so this black curve here is the objective value for the implicit iterates generated by the sketchy Seagal algorithm. And these three curves here show you what happens to the objective error as you decrease the rank of the sketch. So if you take the sketch to have rank 100, the objective residual still goes down like one over T. But if you use a lower rank sketch, you have to suffer more of an error. But nevertheless, you can see that even with low rank approximations to the matrix, this algorithm still generates um, iterates that um, have convergent objective values. The second panel is about the error in satisfying the constraints. So remember, with a standard form SDP, you have to worry about AX equal to B. If you 
use the implicit iterates, you can see that the infeasibility, the error in the constraints goes down like one over T as we run the algorithm. But if we use a sketch to approximate the solution, the low rank approximation is farther away from being feasible. So you see here that it's um, um, the sketch size of 100. Um, there's modest infeasibility, and there's higher infeasibility if you use a very low rank sketch. On the other hand, if you're only interested in the cut value attained by the solution to the SDP, you can see that it doesn't matter whether you sketch the solution or not. All of the trajectories of the iterates of this algorithm have increasing cut values. And after several hundred iterations, the cut values attained by the iterate or its low rank approximations already are at the level that you would get if you used the true solution to the SDP. The bottom three pictures are the same thing, but with time instead of um, um, iteration count as the guidepost. Okay. So in short, after 10 seconds or about 300 iterations, we can produce an adequate solution to a max cut SDP with a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix variable. So not too bad. Um, OK. Good. Any questions on the solution trajectories? Okay. Here's the real evidence of the power of this method. So we applied the sketchy Seagal algorithm to a whole test bed of sparse max cut problems from the G set and from the Dimax 10 challenge set. Um, these plots are indexed by problem size on the horizontal axis and storage or time on the vertical axis. And we tried out all of the standard general purpose SDP solvers on this problem. And you can see that all of them have quadratic storage. And so by the time they get to graphs with 10,000 vertices, they um, flame out because there isn't any more storage available to them on this platform. So this is a laptop equivalent here. One core, 16 gigabytes of storage. Classical algorithms for solving max cup problems cannot handle um, um, graphs with more than 10,000 vertices. And you can also see that the running time is pretty high. But again, these algorithms all die when they run out of storage. In contrast, the sketchy Seagal algorithm that I have outlined for you um, uses much, much less storage for most of these graphs. And as a consequence, can solve max cut problems on graphs with um, over 20 million vertices on a laptop and can do so in a reasonable amount of time. And for the smaller problems, you can see that this algorithm is two orders of magnitude faster than the standard methods, again, to achieve very low um, accuracy, which is adequate for this kind of problem. So um, it's two orders of magnitude faster. But even for graphs with on the order of um, 10 million vertices, we can still solve these problems, although um, on this laptop equivalent, it might take a couple of days of computation. Okay. So by controlling the storage, we're also able to control arithmetic and communication costs. We're able to solve much, much larger problems than we would have been able to solve using a general purpose SDP solver. So any questions on this experiment? Joel, I have a silly question, if I may. Uh, the performance for large sizes seems to be very, very concrete, also for smaller, but something, some, some, some sort of regularity in performance changes yeah. in between. It's Is because that... it's a mix of different problem instances from different places, and some of the problem instances are much harder than others. Um, some of them may have more, um, um, uh, maybe graphs that are less sparse as well. And that's why you see a discrepancy here. My guess is that every one of these is a random graph um, of some type. 
And that's why you see the regularity. These are probably like instances where there is these problems here are probably dislike. Thank or you. Unlike the others. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to show you one more experiment um, to bring things back to the beginning. So this is a Fourier tachography problem based on a linear STP rather than the nonlinear formulation that we began with. So here, um, we're trying to reconstruct an image that has 320 by 320 pixels from 225 illuminations, each of which is much smaller. So this amounts to a linear STP with about a million equations, linear constraints, and about 10 billion variables in the matrix. So just writing this matrix down is going to take somewhere between 40 and 80 gigabytes of storage. And we applied the sketchy Seagal algorithm to solve the linear SDP associated with this Fourier tachography problem. Here are 10 iterations, here are 100 iterations. And after a thousand iterations, you can see that the reconstruction is perceptually fairly high quality as compared with the original. This is about five hours of computation on a laptop. Okay. And after um, um, about 50 hours, so two days, we get a reconstruction that is perceptually almost identical to the original. Okay. So this isn't that fast, but nevertheless, this demonstrates that by using these kinds of ideas, we're able to scale semi-definite programming to heights that really just aren't possible with the classical methods. And we're able to solve an SDP here with 10 billion variables associated with a real application problem um, on a modest computational platform in a reasonable amount of time. And so to conclude, I hope that these ideas um, and extensions change the way that we look at some of these optimization problems and give us more optimism about what we can hope to achieve as computational scientists um, by being more creative and being more careful about how we perform the optimization. And with that, I have a list of the papers that this talk is based on. Um, they're all available on archive. Um, and with that, I thank you, and I'll hang around if there are any more questions. Thank you, Joel. Thank you so much for a great talk. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions, make comments or, or, or uh, suggestions. Hold it to an hour, so uh, we've succeeded in that. In fact, 58 minutes, if, if, if one wants to be precise. Is that in the record? Uh, I had one question. Um, so it, could you go back to the slide where uh, you benchmarked uh, Sketchy Seagal against, I think, three other, four other? Yeah, so in the, uh, in the, um, you know, in, in the low problem size set, could you talk a little bit about uh, how the accuracy compares? Uh